Thanks to Brilliant for supporting my channel. Ah, uh, exams. Some of you might remember that time long ago when we could all sit in the same room breathing that uncirculated air and take stressful exams that might determine our future career and livelihood opportunities. Unfortunately, it turns out that's also a great way to get coronavirus, so many schools have opted to have online exams or cancel exams altogether. And while that second option might seem promising, after all, who enjoys taking exams, the recent IB exam and A results beg to differ. Students around the world ended up receiving lower grades than they were expecting based on their projected scores, with no clear explanation as to why, all because their grades were determined by an algorithm instead of a person. Making matters worse, it looks like these algorithms gave lower scores to schools in lower income areas, disadvantaging lower income students. As one might expect, students and parents are speaking out against these algorithms to the point of literally protesting in the streets. So let's take a couple steps back to figure out what exactly the algorithm grading these students is and why 2020 is the first year that we're really seeing a commotion around these topics to understand where they went wrong. As we talked about earlier this year in my video on how AI is used in schools, there are a lot of different ways that we can use algorithms in the educational system, from automated proctoring to personalized curriculum to grading exams. And the coronavirus pandemic only expedited the implementation of these systems as school closures forced teachers to transition to systems that would allow them to still give students grades without having the same in-class exams or in-person coursework. In fact, for some programs, these school closures meant that the exams that count for the majority of a student's grade wouldn't be happening at all, and some other system had to be developed in order to account for that. Specifically, algorithms were created for students taking their A-level exams in the UK, as well as students taking their international baccalaureate or IB exams around the world. For anyone who's not familiar with either system, A-levels are short for advanced level certifications, which are subject-specific exams that students take in their final year of the UK equivalent of high school. And these exams are really important because students apply to college and receive offers before they've actually taken the exam. So their admissions offers are contingent on the grades that they receive. Normally students will take one or several mock exams throughout the course so that teachers can develop projected grades based on their performance so far. And assuming the student continues to perform at a similar level, they receive a similar grade to what their projected grade was. IB programs work similarly where roughly 80% of your grade is based on your final IB exam for that course. Unfortunately, these final exams were canceled in the cases of both programs because of coronavirus, and so an algorithm was developed to predict students' final grades instead. Let's start with the IB scores, which came out in early July of 2020. Tens of thousands of students received significantly lower scores than they had been projected to receive for no apparent reason. In fact, more than 24,000 students signed a petition asking for more transparency on how these grades were calculated from the IB organization. That represents about 15% of IB students globally. And for some students, these lower algorithmically generated scores meant that offers for universities were rescinded because they weren't high enough. Unfortunately, the IB organization hasn't addressed their petition. In fact, the only statement they've made on the topic is that they didn't use an algorithm, so we don't know exactly how the IB grades were calculated. A-level scores came out about a month later on August 13th with extremely similar results. About 60% of A-level students were graded by an algorithm, and about 40% of students received a significantly lower score than their teacher-predicted scores. This threatened their college plans and also caused outrage and protest. However, later that week, the UK Office of Qualifications and Examination Regulations, or Ofqual, reversed their decision to only use the algorithmically predicted score. Instead, students can choose to take the higher of their teacher-predicted score and the algorithm score, or they can choose to resit for their exams again in the fall. So what were these models and why did they fail so badly? Well, it seems like it was a similar model in both cases, which weighed three main factors. First, the student's performance in the course so far, until the point at which the course had to be stopped because of coronavirus. Second, their projected grade from their teacher, which was based on one or more mock exams and their performance in the class so far. And third, their school's performance history in these subjects. At first glance, this might make sense. After all, just using the student's progress in the course so far was likely not sufficient given that courses were cut short pretty early into the semester because of lockdown and quarantine regulations. On the other hand, predicted scores from teachers could have their own biases, whether teachers might give boys higher scores on math classes or boosting everyone's grades by using their best work instead of their average. 
So adding information on how these schools have performed in the past might help, right? Here's the problem. Many, many, many studies have shown that schools in lower income areas tend to perform worse on examinations like these. After all, the quality of education that a school can provide is usually directly tied to the resources that they have available to them. So under this model, if you have two students who performed equally well so far in the course until schools were shut down and have the same predicted grades from their teachers, the only differentiating factor is the history of the school performance in this course. This means that their algorithmically generated scores may differ indirectly based on whether or not they come from a low-income background. In other words, the model penalized disadvantaged students who are otherwise performing at the same level as students from wealthier areas. Now, while the IB model is shrouded in secrecy, Ofqual actually released a report on the A-level results and details of how the model worked in a 319-page document. And there's a lot of weird stuff in there. The overarching issue is one of trying to solve the wrong problem, which I discuss in my How to Make AI Fairer video. Ofqual was interested in standardizing scores across the board and preventing score inflation not on making sure that the scores reflected the student's actual work. The model's predictions were considered to be accurate if they were within one letter grade of the student's expected grade. So if a student was expected to receive an A, a B would also be considered accurate. Additionally, even if no student had received a U or an F in the historical data from that school, if the model predicted that some percentage of the class had to receive a U, then someone in the class had to receive a U regardless of their performance in the course. Now, students in both cases can appeal their grades, although in the case of IB students, they have to pay for those appeals. But depending on how long the appeal process takes and whether or not students choose to resit for their exams, it may be too late for anyone who is planning to accept an offer that might start this fall. So if algorithmic grading is this problematic, should we even be using it? The short answer is that while all algorithms have their issues, considerably more due diligence could and should have gone into the development of these algorithms. In fact, the Royal Statistical Society offered to give Ofqual access to statisticians who could help them avoid these issues entirely, but Ofqual required those statisticians to sign a five-year NDA that would not allow them to comment on the model itself or any of its results. Knowing that they wouldn't be able to speak out in the event of bias, the statisticians declined. Basically, it might not have been possible to design a perfect model, but it was definitely possible to do better than this. After all, we are in the middle of a global pandemic, so students could not sit for their in-person final exams. So some alternative grading solution had to be developed and algorithms are a valid option if used well. Personally, I have solidly mixed feelings on algorithmic grading. I think that in more cut and dry scenarios, which are really more automated grading, things like the SAT or Scantrons, where the answers are definitive, and in the event that a student argues that a different answer was actually correct, it's actually much easier to then go in and change all of the students' answers, that it's probably okay and probably actually helps teachers. On the other hand, algorithmic grading for things like essays or prediction of students' final scores based on 20% of their course material Seems like a bad idea if there's no human input, no rigorous testing of these algorithms, or if the model's overall goal isn't to predict individual student scores accurately, all of which happened here. Going forward, we'll have to see what the presence of algorithms in our classrooms look like, as many students already are experiencing now. Systems like automated proctoring are becoming much more common as universities go virtual for the fall. So I think these are questions that we're gonna have to continue to wrestle with going forward. And hopefully the mistakes that others have made earlier in the process can inform anyone who's trying to create a similar grading system in the future. But in the meantime, if you'd like to take a class or learn something new without worrying about an algorithm getting your grade wrong, you should check out Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and app that makes learning accessible and fun. As anyone who's watched my videos before knows, I like Brilliant because their approach is based on problem solving and active learning. Instead of passively watching videos, Brilliant's courses are about seeing concepts visually and interacting with them and then answering questions that get you to think. You can take courses on anything from intro to neural networks to quantum computing to cryptocurrencies. In fact, they have courses on most of the topics that we've covered on this channel. Their courses are laid out like a story and are broken down to pieces so that you can tackle them a little bit at a time. There's no tests and no grades from a human or an algorithm. You can just pick a course based on what you're interested in and get started. And if you make a mistake, no big deal. Just check out the explanations to find out more. To get started, go to brilliant.org Jordan or click on the link in the description to sign up for free. 
In fact, the first 200 people who go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Clicking that link supports my channel and gives you access to an amazing library of courses, so please check them out. Otherwise, if you'd like to learn more about how AI and algorithms are used in schools, you can check out my video on that up here. If you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. If you'd like to learn more about my PhD life or have questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments section or tag me on Twitter and Instagram. And otherwise, I'll see you all next Friday. Bye.